thank you for that very warm welcome. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here. Um, so I'll just put my microphone away. Can you, can you all hear me? Even right at the very back? Excellent, okay. Yeah, it's a great privilege to be here. Um, although we have been teaching science and religion for a number of years now in Edinburgh, we don't exist as a center as such, so it's, it's really interesting to see how Samford has set itself up, because there are very few centers for science and religion in the world, in spite of the fact that this discourse is of such importance, I think, in, in modern cultures. Now, when people learn that I teach science and religion, and that I'm also interested in the topic of miracles in the Bible, they often ask me, the title of my talk, Does Science Disprove the Miracles of Jesus? Although usually they ask it more in the tone of, well, surely science disproves the miracles of Jesus, doesn't it? Well, my answer is always a very firm no to that. Science does not disprove the miracles of Jesus. But I don't say that because I'm a Christian and want to defend my faith. In fact, I want to suggest tonight that actually the most secure answer to this question has to be no anyway, whatever your religious beliefs or lack of beliefs. In other words, whether you are a Christian here tonight or a Muslim or Hindu or an agnostic or an atheist or any other kind of religious persuasion, I hope that by the end you will agree with me or at at least follow my line of reasoning, that no, science does not disprove the miracles of Jesus. So I'll, this is a summary of my talk. First of all, I'll say a few words of introduction about how I came to the topic of science and religion, how it's relevant to this subject of miracles. I'll then ask the question of what is a miracle, which actually turns out to be astonishingly difficult. And then I'll ask, well, what are the miracles of Jesus? That's a rather simpler question to answer, although not straightforward. Before getting more into the kind of real meat of why I'm here, do the miracles contradict science? And then sort of closing with this question of, well, what is the meaning of the miracles? And how might science impact on this? First of all, let me give you some autobiography. There are two pictures there. On the top left you have an aerial view of where I have spent most of my scientific career working there for about 10 or 12 years. That's the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory near Oxford. Um, it's one of the main sites for large scientific experiments that individual universities couldn't house in the UK. And my job there as one of the staff scientists was to run a particular experiment. Users would come from the UK, Europe, all over the world to, to work on these experiments with me. So I got to know an awful lot of people internationally um, who were interested in working in um, the particular area of condensed matter physics that I, that I work in, namely the physics of magnetism. Um, that also shows you on the bottom right my current workplace, which is the School of Divinity, or also known as New College in Edinburgh. And if you know the city of Edinburgh, you'll know that that place is a wonderful building. It's part of this <clears throat> very famous skyline right next to the glorious Edinburgh Cathedral. It's a terrific place to work. Um, but of course, as a scientist, I now work with theologians, which does create some kind of interesting tensions and dialogues at times. I've had to do an awful lot of learning anyway. And this talk is partly about my own journey of learning. Now, when I used to be working full-time in science at the Rutherford Laboratory, uh, I was asked this question again and again by the, 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 the visiting scientists who would come to work with me when I expressed a certain amount of kind of, well, because our experiments used to run 24 hours a day over weekends as well. And if I said, well, I don't think I'll be in on Sunday morning, can you look after it yourself? And they say, why? And I said, well, I'd like to go to church, really. And so it quickly came out generally that I was a, was, you know, a very keen, committed Christian. And I was asked this question again and again, how can you be a Christian if you're a scientist? Well, my usual answer used to be something like this. There's no conflict between science and religion or Christianity or my faith. Well, that was my usual answer. But I have to admit that over time, I became increasingly unsure about that answer. 
and I realized that I was giving it really to try to deflect attention from uh, the question of, well, let's discuss my own faith. Um, and I realized that what I was also doing was erecting something of a brick wall inside me between my identity as a scientist on the one hand and as a religious believer on the other. Well, after about uh, 10 years or so working at the Rutherford Laboratory, I became interested in exploring ordained ministry in the Church of England. And one of the things, as Josh mentioned, one of the opportunities that gave me was to study theology uh, full-time as a degree. And that was a fantastic journey of discovery for me, which I had, you know, had no idea uh, uh, what academic theology was about. And neither did I realize at the time, until I started studying theology, that there's a whole academic discipline which exists to try to address and make headway with the difficult questions of how science and religion might relate. And I came across this character, Ian Barber. You may have heard about this man. Sadly, he, he died about a year and a half ago. He's often referred to as the founder of science and religion because he was the first person really to start to set it on an academic footing. And what I quickly realized in reading his works and those who followed him was the complexity of the relationship between science and religion. So me, in my rather naive way, saying, well, there's no conflict, um, you know, Ian Barber had thought rather more seriously about this and suggested, well, yes, there is conflict, and there are other things too. So one of the things I discovered was, and this is the thing he's particularly well known for, um, his fourfold series of models for how to relate science and religion to each other. Um, they work in a kind of evolutionary sense. So you start off with model one, suggesting that, well, certainly the popular perception is that science and religion are in conflict with each other. That might be your entry level into thinking about the relationships. But then as you begin to um, develop the models of interaction further, think further about the ways in which they interact, you would have to recognize that actually there's quite a large degree of independence between science and religion. Large areas of science, large areas of religious thought and practice, which don't really have any um, close impact on each other. And then progressing further, you would hopefully start to engage in dialogue with science and religion. They might begin to learn from each other. Stage four is the most optimistic of all of Barber's um, sort of models in this, this evolutionary phase, that of integration, suggesting that perhaps science and religion, science and theology might learn from each other so much that they become something of the same exercise or enterprise. Well, I'm going to talk to you about miracles tonight. Um, they actually illustrate this complexity very, very well. Because when you look at my title, Does Science Disprove the Miracles of Jesus? You find that there are valid approaches to this question that fall in each of Barber's four categories. Now, to begin to see this, we need to do some groundwork. So I'm afraid it'll be a while before we get to Jesus. We, we will get there eventually, though. Um, first of all, I want to ask, what is a miracle? Now, the definition of miracle is a really long-standing problem in philosophy and theology. It has many, many different solutions, only some of which see miracles in conflict with science. But of course, if you went out onto the street and asked someone, well, what do you think a miracle is? Pretty soon, you're going to get the um, definition that a miracle is a, is a conflict with science or a breaking, a violation of the laws of nature. And this understanding tends to go back to, or we trace it back, to the 18th century philosopher, the Scottish philosopher, he, he came, came and lived, lived uh, he lived in Edinburgh, David Hume. And in fact, in that picture there, you'll see him on Edinburgh's Royal Mile with St. Giles Cathedral in the background. His definition is usually taken as the, taken as the starting point for any modern study of miracles. As I said, this tends to be near ubiquitous in our modern world. And this is what he says. Actually, it's only in a footnote to the chapter on miracles, but it's the one that everyone knows. A miracle may be accurately defined, a transgression of a law of nature by a particular volition of the deity or by the interposition of some invisible agent 
So here he sees miracles in conflict with the laws of nature. And of course, the laws of nature, as we understand them, tend to think of that as the domain of science. So a miracle, in his understanding, only happens when one form of reality, a religious form, such as the deity, violently invades the other, the natural world, in other words. Otherwise, there are no points of contact between the religious deity and the scientific world, the natural world. So Hume's definition of miracle is a very sharp representation of the idea that science and religion are fundamentally opposed in conflict with each other. And perhaps that's why this understanding is so ubiquitous in our modern world, because it serves that kind of agenda that you often hear, that science and religion cannot exist except by being in conflict with each other, which I think is true of some areas, but not that many. Notice, though, that this does make use of what I'm calling a juridical, namely concerned with you know, law courts, legal understanding, um, a very ancient juridical metaphor, the idea that there are laws of nature. Now, we tend to think of that term, law of nature, as really being all about the, the territory, the domain of science. But actually, that idea that nature might be compared, or the regularities of nature might be compared with human law, in an, uh, as an analogy, has actually been around for thousands of years. You can trace it back to the early Greek philosophers. You can find the idea in the Hebrew Bible. It really isn't um, something that Hume came up with, neither is it something that Descartes and the early modern scientists came up with. But what Hume is doing here is relying on that very ancient metaphor. It is a metaphor, okay? Remember that, the laws of nature. And that leads us on to to critiques that are often made of Hume's understanding. The first of all, that by talking about laws of nature which can only be broken or violated, it sets up a kind of stratospherically high view of the laws of nature and of our ability to know them. So the laws can't be questioned or revised. They are so rigid that they can only be violently abused and only by a deity. So nature is fixed and closed in this understanding. Now, this might have seemed a fair conclusion in Hume's day when science was dominated by um, the mechanics of Newton, a kind of clockwork universe, if you like, very deterministic, but that can hardly be said to be the case today. Um, you know, we know an awful lot more about the universe uh, the workings of physics at, at, at microscopic levels, quantum mechanics, complexity, relativity, all of these things suggest that nature is not quite as deterministic and as rigid as was thought in, the, in, in Hume's day. Also, philosophers of science are deeply divided about the laws of nature, how we should understand the metaphor to begin with. Are the laws descriptive, uh, prescriptive of nature, I should say? In other words, they rule nature, just as Hume seems to suppose. Or are they descriptive? In other words, they're our best guess at trying to describe what we see. If it turns out that the laws are descriptive, then Hume's definition would totally fall down. But he seems to assume that they are prescriptive. Now, this also relies on a rather incoherent use of that juridical metaphor, because a miracle can only occur when the deity or an invisible agent, in other words, something beyond our experience, something uh, which is therefore supernatural, when, when one of those transgresses the laws. Now, think about the way this metaphor is working laws of nature, the one who upholds them and puts them in place is, of course, the deity. The lawmaker is also the law enforcer, but in Hume's understanding, the law break, the lawmaker and law enforcer must also be the law breaker. So it, it, it's not a very coherent um, uh, use of that metaphor. So what I'm suggesting is that the weaknesses in this definition are all around um, our understanding and Hume's understanding of the laws of nature. So how does Hume understand this term, laws of nature? I've already said a little bit about this, 
Well, he goes on later on in the work to define exactly what he means by law of nature. And he defines them in terms of our firm and unalterable experience, such as, and this is what he says, um, so a firm and unalterable experience has established these laws that all men must die, so these are examples he's giving, um, that lead cannot of itself remain suspended in the air, that fire consumes wood and is extinguished by water, and so he goes on. So these are, these are his examples. These are what laws of nature are to him. But how firm and unalterable are these laws? Well, if you look into it, you will find that um, lead can actually remain suspended of itself if it's in a magnetic field. This is something called the Meissner effect, which for lead kicks in at about seven degrees Kelvin, seven degrees above absolute zero. Um, there are also versions of fire which can burn underwater. That's what that diver is doing, welding there. And this is rather speculative. There are people um, investigating the idea technologically whether it is meaningful to speak about immortality. In other words, you know, to, to put off human death indefinitely. Is that possible technologically? Clearly it isn't at the moment, but there are people who think it will be in perhaps just 50 years ago, uh, 50 years or so. Um, it's very, very speculative. But the fact that there are people beginning to think this suggests that it's not beyond the realm of imagination, at least. And what I'm trying to say here is that these examples that, her, that Hume uses aren't so very firm and un unalterable after all. Science is constantly moving. It's unwise to be too prescriptive about what we think are the laws of nature. Yesterday's miracle may turn out to be tomorrow's scientific law. In any case, a miracle doesn't need to contradict science or transgress laws of nature. A good example of this is a book by Colin Humphreys. He's a physicist who works in Cambridge. Um, he's well, knew, well known for his views on the miracles of the Exodus, such as the plagues of Egypt or the crossing of the Red Sea. He thinks that they can all be explained scientifically, but the miracle is in the timing. So Moses and the Israelites just happened to be on the shores of the Red Sea at the right time as this naturalistic thing happened which parted the Red Sea. Um, he provides a great example, actually, which you've got a little picture there, of um, Joshua and the Israelites crossing the River Jordan. If you remember in the, the story in the book of Joshua, the river stops flowing, dries up, and they cross over and then attack the city of Jericho. Well, it turns out that actually the River Jordan does stop flowing sometimes. Um, this area is prone to earthquakes, and higher upstream, there are some very steep and very kind of unconsolidated um, sediments on the, the banks of the river, which when there are earthquakes, they can slip into the river and stop the flow for a few hours. And the idea is that perhaps Joshua and the Israelites were standing on the, sh on, on the banks of the River Jordan just when there was an earthquake, which stopped the flow of the river. So therefore, they were, they were there at just the right time. The miracle is in the timing. Now, since I've started introducing texts into the issue here, Exodus, it's worth going back to Hume again, because actually he's very interesting on how to assess texts and how to analyze reports of miracles. I actually think that despite the problems that I introduced around his definition of miracles, he's actually very strong on this point of analyzing texts. And I think he makes for quite positive perspectives on miracles if we look at the rest of what he says. Now, he provides a really interesting thought experiment on how to analyze a miracle report, whether you believe it or not. He asks what kind of evidence we would need to believe to, um, or need to see in order to believe in resurrection. Think about the famous Tudor Queen of England, Elizabeth I. She was the daughter of Henry VIII, um, who had six wives. Um, the history books tell us that she died in 1603. But let's suppose, Hume says, that evidence comes to light that actually she died in 1600, and then came back to life and reigned for another three years, and finally died a second time in 1603. 
What kind of historical testimony would convince us of this story? Would we need to see the written evidence of doctors, of numerous courtiers of good standing? Would that convince us? Well, Hume's point is, of course it wouldn't convince us. What a ridiculous story. No amount of witness evidence or testimony would convince us of that. Now, clearly, he's making a bit of a swipe at the story of the resurrection of Jesus, but it's quite a clever one because, of course, no one has anything invested in the resurrection of Elizabeth. So in reading Hume, you're likely to, to, to go along with him and assume his default position of skepticism that dead people just don't come back to life. With Jesus, on the other hand, depending on your religious beliefs, you may have a different position. But with Elizabeth, of course, no one stands to gain anything one way or another. So we're most likely to conclude with Hume that there was some kind of mistake or counterfeit or fraud, that any this evidence we might be presented with just simply couldn't be trustworthy. And this is what he says, that no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavours to, to establish. You might need a little moment to think about that. What he's saying is that for a potentially miraculous event to be accepted, the witness to it must be so unimpeachable, so perfect, that it's more plausible to believe in the miracle than to believe this perfect witness might be wrong. You just think about that for a minute. He's saying that to accept that a miracle happened, the probability of the witness being wrong must be so minute that it's actually smaller than the probability the miracle happened in the first place. And his point is, of course, that there is no witness that is going to be that persuasive. We will always assume the point of, uh, we will always assume um, a view of skepticism. But hang on a minute, I think. Well, what about the resurrection of Jesus? I mean, there are, I think, over a billion people today who believe in that miracle. But if you follow Hume's argument, then not a single one of them should believe on the evidence of the Gospels alone. So why do people believe in the resurrection of Jesus then? Well, quite simply, it's because Belief in miracle is only partly about analyzing witness reports. And I think this is where Hume was wrong. You need to go beyond what he says about witness reports. Just as important is to take into, take into account our worldview, a very useful umbrella term for capturing all kinds of subjective um, predispositions that we might have about the world and our relationship with it. So if we ask, what makes the difference between belief in the resurrection of Elizabeth and the resurrection of Jesus, the difference is that those billions or billion or so people who claim to um, believe in the, the resurrection of Jesus believe so because in addition to the testimony of the, the evangelists in the four gospels and the, the church, they have also presumably experienced some kind of relationship with Jesus, a living relationship which stands in addition to whatever the witness testimony of the Gospels can provide. After all, the Gospels just taken entirely on their own, according to Hume, um, would only count as rather weak evidence of the resurrection. But of course, those who believe actually have something else to go on as well. These personal predispositions, worldview, what we often lump together under the term faith, which is really barely adequate to capture everything at stake. So what I'm saying here is that there are personal and subjective factors to take into account when we try to define what a miracle is and how you would establish that one had occurred. We simply can't extricate ourselves from the definition of miracle. We are effectively in there with it. We can't kind of extricate ourselves to form some kind of distant objective view. And just to illustrate this, a bit of light relief, these are some pictures, of course, I got them off the internet. Um, the face of Jesus in everyday items. Now, what I find is interesting is the level of enthusiasm that these inspire. So 
top left, you've got a picture of, um, well, it, it is a picture of a tree with a sort of a shape in the bark, which looks like the figure of Jesus. You can see that someone has very enthusiastically put some flowers and candles at the foot of it. It clearly means something to someone. Um, the bottom left picture is some mold on a shower curtain. Again, I mean, th this was, you know, claimed to be uh, perhaps lightheartedly, but, you know, at least it looks a bit like Jesus. And the, the top right is really interesting. It's a piece of toast with the image of the Virgin Mary. Now, this sold on eBay in 2004 for $28,000. So, I mean, you can't escape the fact that, that these items are, there is something, many people invest in them. Perhaps they might believe that they bring luck or something. It's really hard to say, but they're not just, that's not just a bit of toast. And that reminds me of, so the bottom right, you've got um, the headline from the Asian age. In fact, this, this story appeared in newspapers throughout the world. It's called the Hindu milk miracle. In 1995, it was discovered that statues of Ganesh, this um, Hindu uh, elephant deity, in a number of world cities were discovered to drink offerings of milk. It's this little bowl of milk that was presented to the statue um, the statue would suck the milk up. And this was accorded as an incredible miracle. Hundreds of thousands of people across India in particular flocked to see it. Now, the fact that scientists quickly um, explained that these statues were all made of very porous stone, and um, this was capillary action, it did nothing to deter the hundreds of thousands of enthusiastic believers. So, I mean, that, that tells you something about the relationship between science and subjective predispositions. And this leads me to go on to emphasize the subjective factors at play in trying to define miracle. Now, the great German theologian of the early 19th century, Friedrich Schleiermacher, took this point about subjective, um, the subjective component of belief in miracles to extremes. He said, to me, all is miracle. I mean, clearly, he, it's a sort of statement of faith in a way, you know, um, that the, my, the faith is so strong that I can see God's hand in everything, even the most ordinary. The trouble is that if you claim that everything is miracle, then, well, nothing is. So it's, it's a kind of, it emphasizes the subjective to such a degree that effectively miracle evaporates. Well, defining miracle is, as I've been saying, it's a very tricky task. We have, a tension, we have a tension between subjectivity and objectivity, which becomes very, very difficult. We want to try to hold the subjective factors in play here, our worldview predispositions, which will be different for every person, um, as much as any supposed objective factors, which might include relationship with science. But how do you do that? How do you hold the subjective and the objective in tension with each other? This is really difficult. And if you're not careful, you end up with a definition like this. A miracle is what a believer in miracles believes is a miracle. I mean, that's no good to anyone, is it? Um, a much more useful working definition, I think, is this. A miracle is a reported event which, it is claimed, was caused directly by a transcendent power. Now, that, that's my attempt to try to capture everything. It's not perfect, but it's the best I can come up with. Notice the importance of report here. A miracle isn't a miracle unless there's someone to witness it. Rather like the question of, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there, does it make a noise? Well, of course it does. I mean, that's just stupid. Of course it makes a noise. But if a miracle happens and there's no one there to see it, is it a miracle? No, it's not. A miracle needs a witness. Note, therefore, that a miracle must always involve a claim, often a very challenging claim, which we need to assess. So a miracle always invites or demands assessment on perhaps many levels. Now, it's possible that that claim might be challenged by science, but not necessarily, as some of the miracles I'm going to talk about, um, that's the case. So there's a complexity here between subjectivity and objectivity and the ongoing nature of assessment. And that's why I think, as a Christian, it's important for me to keep reflecting 
critically on miracles. This is not a question I have solved for myself, and I don't expect I ever will. Miracles have been given to me, to us if you're a Christian, as gifts to inspire faith, but also to challenge and correct it. I'm convinced that no miracle is value-free. No one, I think, just believes in a miracle, any miracle. If you think you do just believe, I'd like to suggest that perhaps you haven't yet engaged with it. Let me explain more by going into the miracles of Jesus. First of all, just to mention the sources we have, predominantly these are the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We also have a number of um, what are often referred to as apocryphal Gospels, which also describe miracle stories of Jesus, um, and some non-Christian sources which attest to um, Jesus' miracle-working um, uh, abilities, such as from the Babylonian Talmud, this little quote, Jesus the, Jesus the Nazarene practiced sorcery and instigated and seduced Israel to idolatry. Now, claims are sometimes made that Jesus didn't exist. Well, this is historical nonsense. Jesus is one of the best attested historical figures of antiquity. Any rational assessment of the historical sources we have would have to conclude that not only did he exist, but he was also believed to be a miracle worker because we find that point not only in the Christian sources, but also in non-Christian sources, which are hostile to Christianity, such as that quote from the Talmud. So I would say that whatever our predispositions for or against miracles, it's clear by any reasonable historical approach that Jesus was known as a miracle worker in his day, especially as a healer and exorcist. His miracles are very diverse though. If the problem of defining miracle is complex, well, it turns out this complexity increases when we start to look at how the miracles of Jesus might work. So I will give you a very, very quick summary of how I see them or gather them up. First of all, you have to um, look at the story we're presented with in the Gospels, and you find there are miraculous life events throughout his story. So there's the virgin birth, of course, which is given to us in uh, Matthew and Luke. There's the story of the baptism, which has the heavenly voice and the Holy Spirit come down, coming down as a dove. The temptation in the wilderness, where various miraculous events seem to happen in conjunction with the devil. The calling of the disciples, where Jesus has supernatural knowledge. And in fact, of course, there's the whole um, Jesus, knowledge that Jesus appears to have of his divine destiny. Fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, which, which he clearly seems to be expecting in himself. There's the transfiguration on the mountaintop, the resurrection, the miracle to end all miracles, and finally the ascension in Luke's Gospel and Acts, where he's taken up into heaven. So there are miraculous elements to the whole story that we're presented with. If you go and look at individual sets of miracles, certainly healing stories, we have a lot of those, so um, we find Jesus healing people of skin diseases. Um, what is often translated into English as leprosy, although in the ancient world this probably referred to as a whole series, probably meant a whole series of skin diseases, not necessarily what we mean as leprosy today. Um, blindness, various physical disabilities, and even raising people back to life. And of course, um, particularly in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have um, various stories of exorcisms, Jesus driving out evil spirits. Then we have what I can only think of as miscellaneous miracles. I can't think of any real way to gather these together, where Jesus has supernatural knowledge of various kinds um, and some slightly strange miracles, such as the withering of the fig tree, where he curses a fig tree um, that, doesn't, that isn't bearing fruit, and it withers. Um, also the miracle of the coin in the fish's, fish's mouth where he and Peter need to pay their tax. They don't have any money, they're broke. So Jesus tells Peter to go and catch a fish and there will be a coin in its mouth. And then the most difficult miracles to appreciate or to, to kind of come to terms with from a modern standpoint, what you might call the nature miracles, and I've broken them down into two types. There's sea miracles, such as the stilling of the storm, walking on the water, and feeding miracles such as the wedding at Cana, water into wine, the feeding of the 5,000 and 4,000, and then 
the miraculous catch of fish. Let's gather these together into an overview. I mean, you have to admit, I think, there's a great deal of complexity in these stories. We have lots of very disparate stories and traditions that are reported at every stage in the story of Jesus. Now, some of these stories show similarities with other miracle workers that we know about from ancient texts from around the same time in the Jewish and Greco-Roman world, such as the well-known figure of Hanina ben Dosa, who was also a Galilean. And some of the Jesus stories are also similar to um, stories told of legendary figures in the Old Testament, such as Elijah, who also ascended into heaven, we're told. Other stories, though, are unique to Jesus, and in particular, it seems that Jesus was highly distinctive in his time of having more stories told about his abilities as a healer and an exorcist than any other miracle worker. And what you have to conclude from this, I think, is that the miracle stories are part of the bedrock of who Jesus is, if we're trying to build a picture of him as an historical figure. And that's whether we come predisposed to believe in the divine identity that Christianity accords with him, uh, accords him with, or, or, um, or predisposed to be skeptical about that. I think historically it's inescapable that Jesus was known in his day as a miracle worker. Okay, you might say, as many do say to me, I'm happy to believe that Jesus existed historically and maybe people believed he was a miracle worker at the time, but surely we know better because his miracles contradict science. Well, I have two responses to that. The first is to point out that ancient people weren't as gullible and superstitious as we often assume. We have Greek, Roman, and Jewish texts discussing miracles, and they display just as much hard-headed cynicism and skepticism as anything today. And the second is to ask, well, well, do we really know that the miracles of Jesus contradict science? So, so let's look at that question. Do the miracles of Jesus contradict science? Well, quite apart from the point I made earlier about Hume's definition of miracle, that the idea of miracle is really rather tricky to define, so it's not clear whether it has to disobey science or not. Well, there are other ways of, of saying, no, the miracles of Jesus don't contradict science. For instance, the miraculous catch of fish, where Jesus tells the disciples to cast the net over onto the other side, and quite... Uh, Amazingly, they catch this huge load of fish. You could explain that and say, well, this could have been a coincidence, or rather, you know, they just happened to throw the net into the water at the right time, the right place. As Colin Humphrey's um, study of Exodus might suggest, you know, it, perhaps God caused the this huge shoal of fish to swim by at just the right time. In any case, no laws of nature were being broken there. If there is a miracle, it's purely in the timing. Perhaps God caused it to happen, perhaps it was just coincidence. In any case, you know, that doesn't conflict with science as far as I can, I can see. You could even say that of the stilling of the storm. The storm stopped at just the right time, but no laws of nature were broken. Now, furthermore, um, one quite interesting thing that scholars have been doing in connection with the miracles of Jesus is looking at social scientific studies of faith healers around today and pointing out that there are many interesting parallels between the way that faith healers are known to heal, um, often psychosomatic conditions um, associated with social issues to do with exclusion and purity and so on. Um, there are parallels here with understanding the healing activities of Jesus. Does that explain his, his healing uh, scientifically? Perhaps. Um, also, some of the miracles can be rationalized or explained away, and I'm sure you're familiar with this idea. Um, for instance, the explanation that the feeding of the 5,000 was really just a kind of a, an unexpected uh, event of sharing. So when the disciples started sharing around what little they had, other people in the crowd um, were inspired to share what they had, and before you knew it, suddenly everyone had enough to eat. Perhaps that's what happened. Or walking on the water. Perhaps Jesus was actually walking on a submerged sand, sandbank is, is one explanation I've heard. 
Um, that picture, by the way, comes from the artist Tex Jernigan, his work called Walk on Water. Um, he actually has this person standing on a submerged platform. It's quite well done, though, because, of course, you can see the waves, so it looks as though it's in deep water. The resurrection of Jesus. This is also frequently rationalized. Um, in fact, we have the earliest rationalization recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, when Jesus disappears from the tomb, the high priests tell the guards to say that the disciples stole the body in the night. So that's a, a very early example of rationalization. Um, there are certainly many, many more. The most recent that I know of use particle physics and cosmology to suggest that Jesus' body was transformed into other kinds of particles like neutrinos that can pass through stone or that he disappeared into a cosmological wormhole. Now, these become extremely fanciful, almost as, as fanciful as simply saying that a dead man came back to life. Um, so, I mean, there is a difficulty here with the rationalization enterprise. It might seem to explain away the difficulties of the narrative, but it's, what it's doing really is replacing the narrative with an alternative narrative, which I think misses the point a bit. So you might conclude, perhaps, then, that there's a sense in which the miracles, well, we do want them to contradict science. So you could also say, take the opposite viewpoint and say, yes, the miracles do contradict science. I am not convinced by that rationalization, you could say. It's simply missing the point that there is something extraordinary happening here, which only God could do. And in that case, you know, you don't care whether they are seen to contradict science. Well. We're in something of a quandary now. The fact that the, the, the question of whether the miracles contradict science can be answered as both no and yes, each with good reasons, suggests that it's not actually a very penetrating question. A much more penetrating question, I think, is this. Is it important whether the miracles contradict science? And I would have to conclude no. Asking whether the miracles contradict science doesn't actually tell you very much. And that's because the stories we have, these aren't recorded as repeatable, testable events of the kinds that science works with. They're one-offs. All of these miracles alike are recorded to point to the significance of Jesus. And so each one, I think, and I'm firmly convinced of this, each miracle story must be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. And this becomes especially clear when we look beyond the surface reading of the text and look at how the miracles function in the narrative. Not just what is reported, but what is the deeper significance of what we're told. And straight away, we often find deeper currents here, careful structuring and symbolism in the stories. And we notice that the question of how a miracle relates to science is actually only half the story. For instance, the sea miracles parallel the exorcisms of Jesus in illustrating his power over creation to keep it in order and to vanquish the powers of chaos. So the miracles indicate that Jesus has power over nature. He can do what only, only God can do in the Old Testament, but there's a strong connection with his message in the Synoptic Gospels that the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, the kingship of the world is very, very soon going to change from that of the devil to that of God. So there's a kind of cosmic significance in his teaching, which is also played out in his miracles as well. They support each other, the miracles and the teaching, very deliberate in the, in the way the evangelists tell these stories. Or the enigmatic withering of the fig tree in Mark 11. Very, very strange story that he just decides to curse this fig tree. Well, if you actually look at the structure of the story, it actually tops and tails the cleansing of the temple in Jerusalem. So you could see the fig tree as a commentary on the temple, suggesting that the fruitlessness of the fig tree parallels the fruitlessness of the temple as Mark sees it, and hence symbolizes its destruction, its withering. And perhaps the best example is the feeding of the 5,000 which has very heavy and dense symbolism, quite apart from the question of, well, did these loaves and fish magically multiply? There are elements of the Last Supper in here, the Messianic banquet, the manna in the wilderness, and Jesus as the new Moses, and I could go on and on. Um, quite apart from a, 
whether this is an impressive story or not, it's also an enacted parable about the significance of Jesus. And in fact, the Gospels are very upfront about telling us this. So if you look at the, towards the end of John's Gospel, uh, we find this. Now, Jesus did many other signs, that is, miracles, in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. There's also this great little text from Mark's Gospel. This is where um, Jesus goes back to, back to his hometown in Nazareth and finds that he can't perform miracles there because the people are so skeptical, they know him really well, that actually he effectively has no power. So clearly, um, you know, his ability to perform miracles is very closely connected to whether the people believe in him or not. It's like the thing I was mentioning earlier with Hume, there's a subjective as well as any objective uh, component in miracles. And so I will just conclude now by saying, you know, the question I started out with does science disprove the miracles of Jesus? I spoke, I introduced the idea of science and religion and mentioned how miracle is actually a rather nice touchstone for looking at the way science and religion might relate. I asked this very difficult question of what is a miracle and suggested that there is no hard and fast objective, um, distanced way of defining it, but we need to take our own subjective predispositions into account. I looked at what are the miracles of Jesus, suggested that they are very complex. Um, do they contradict science? I gave you a yes and a no here, and suggested that actually the meaning of the miracles is at least as important as whether they might be said to contradict science or not. So I think the issues we have in these miracle stories are of sufficient complexity that science can only speak to the miracles of Jesus on a surface level. I mean, they, it, science can help us to understand the magnitude of the challenge we face in assessing these stories, but they certainly can't disprove a miracle altogether. We need to look at each of them on a case-by-case on -case basis. And as we do so, we assess the significance and the ongoing challenge to us of each individual miracle. And in this, I want to make the point that your own attitude to miracles does matter in this, and that these stories do exist to challenge as much to inspire. These are not supposed to be easy stories, which you just read and go, yep, yeah, fine. It's, and it's also not enough, I think, to say, yes, I believe in the miracles of Jesus, and leave it at that. By doing so, you would be overlooking the constant challenge that these texts face us with. And what I suggest is that if you take the New Testament seriously, for your own religious beliefs, then I would suggest you need to keep asking yourself what you believe about these miracles and why. Now, you've noticed that I've said very little about my own belief in miracles, but I hope you can see the question that I've posed for this talk, namely, does science disprove the miracles of Jesus, is actually rather different to do I believe in the miracles of Jesus? That's a whole new question for a whole new talk. Thank you for listening.